him and was diagnosed. Ayan, I repeat again. Uh, please keep Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just repeat the. Okay, uh, I'm presenting a case on benign prostatic hyperplasia. Uh, our patient today is JNM, 70 year old male from Kinango, married with six children, who is a farmer and was admitted three days ago. Uh, his chief complaints were two month history of increased frequency of micturation, two month history of slow urinary strain. Our patient is known to have benign prostatic hyperplasia since 2019 and was diagnosed based on clinical evaluation. That was a thorough history and DRE and was confirmed on prostate ultrasound revealing an enlarged prostate of 68 mils of volume who is on phenosine tablets. That's a combination of phenosteride 5 milligram and some tolosine 400 microgram. He has been on this medication for three years with little or no improvement on the symptoms, and he reports to have been compliant with the medication and is on follow-up at the urology clinic at KNH. Apart from that, our patient is also known to have hypertension for more than 10 years. He is on Cavedilol, 6.25 milligram once daily, enalapril, 10 milligram once daily, and amlodipine, 10 milligram once daily. He reports to be compliant with the medication and is on follow-up at the medical outpatient clinic at KNH. Uh, he was relatively well until two months ago when he developed increased frequency of urination and poor stream. The increment was of insidious in onset and gradually progressive with up to 12 to 14 times a day without increasing water intake. It was associated history of waking up at night frequently to urinate with up to seven to eight times. This has prompted the patient to wear adult diapers and it has really affected his activities of daily living. Uh, the patient reports the history of poor stream, uh, which was exaggerated on straining. Uh, sometimes the poor stream was followed by passage of few drops of urine in his undergarment. There is also a history of inability to hold urine once the urge to urinate was initiated. On a few occasions, he had soiled his clothes due to inability to hold the urine before rushing for micturation. And most of the time, he reports that he had trouble starting urination. To urination sorry. He reports no history of blood in urine. There's no history of pain during urination, no urethral discharge, no loin pain. However, there is history of urethral instrumentation, meaning that he had been having indwelling catheters on multiple occasions that he presented with acute urinary retention. He also reports no hotness of body. There's no chills. There's no reduced appetite. No history of involuntary loss of weight. No night sweat. No fatigue. No bone pain. Patient denies any history of scrotal pain or swelling. He reports no history of sensory or motor deficit. There is no history of trauma, negative history of sexual dysfunction, negative history of sexual transmitted infection. He denies history of alcohol consumption or smoking tobacco. There is no family history of similar symptoms. Since his last visit at the clinic, that's the urology clinic at KNH, that was three months ago, the international prostate symptom score was at 25. And since admission, urinalysis, full blood count, prostate ultrasound, and prostate uh, specific antigen levels were done. Uh, the rest were all normal, except the prostate ultrasound that showed a large prostate of 68 mil of volume. The patient is scheduled for transuteral uh, urethral resection of prostate on 21st of this month, 2020, uh, sorry, of this month. So on the past medical history, this is his third admission. Uh, I was unable to get the reasons why he was admitted, uh, the, two, the two previous admissions. 
Uh, something to uh, to note is that, or to point out is that the patient had, it was a bit difficult to clap this patient because they had reduced hearing levels in both ears. So that's why I was unable to capture some of the things that uh, you guys will point out later if I've not mentioned in my history. Uh, there's no history of previous surgeries. There's no history of blood transfusion. The patient is seronegative. There is no known food or drug allergy. And the family history is the fourth born of seven children, three boys and four girls who are all alive and well. Both parents are deceased. Uh, mother died from road traffic accidents and the father passed away due to an unknown illness. He's a father of six children, two boys and four girls who are all alive, well and healthy. He's married to one partner. He's also alive and healthy. There's negative family history of chronic illness. Our patient is, has an active NHIS. He's financially stable. He lives in two bedroom house made of bricks. That's well aerated. They cook with firewood and boil their drinking water. They use pit latrine. They burn the litter. They don't keep any dogs or cats. And the review of system, uh, CNS, apart from the hearing difficulties, uh, the rest was unremarkable. Same to cardiovascular system, respiratory system, GIT, Musculoskeletal, there was a bit of myalgia, and the cutaneous aspect was also unremarkable. Uh, in summary, our patient, JNM, who is known to have benign prostatic hyperplasia since 2019 on phenocene tablets, currently presenting with gradually worsening symptoms of increased frequency of micturation, poor stream, nocturia, agency, and straining with uh, international prostate symptom score of 25. He's also a non-hypertensive of more than 10 years on cabidolol, amlodipine, and enalapril. General examination, I observed an elderly man sitting, uh, lying supine in bed, well nourished and in general fair condition, in no obvious respiratory distress, oriented in time, place, and person. His vital were the pulse rate was uh, 100 beats per minute, regular, and of normal volume, uh, the, patient, the, the blood pressure, he, he was hypertensive, systolic of 144 and diastolic of 94. Uh, the respiratory rate, uh, it was normal, 16 breaths per minute. The temperature was also normal. Uh, there was no jaundice, there was no pallor, there was no cyanosis, there was no lymphadenopathy, edema, wasting, or rehydration. The systemic examination, her abdomen, uh, uh, I inspected an abdomen of normal contour, moving with respiration, no obvious cuts, no superficially dilated veins or muscles. On, palpation, on superficial palpation, there was mild tenderness on the suprapubic region. And on deep palpation, there was no obvious organomegaly or obvious muscles. On percussion, uh, tympanic, uh, the abdomen was tympanic across all the quadrant. There was uh, absence of dullness, of shifting dullness and fluid change. On aspaltating, there was normal bowel sound. Uh, I did not perform a digital rectal examination myself, but the doctor that, uh, there was a doctor that I found in the ward, and he assisted me in doing the digital rectal examination. Uh, so the report was that uh, a symmetrically enlarged prostate was palpated with smooth surface, palm, rubbery like consistency, it was non-tender, with deepened median sulcus and lateral groups, mobility of the rectal mucosa was not restricted. On the cardiovascular examination, inspecting, there was a normal active pericardium, no surgical scars that were present. On palpating, the apex beat was palpable in the fifth intercostal space, mid-clavicular line, no heaves or tears were palpable. On palpating, S1 and S2 were hard, no mammals. On the respiratory examination, symmetrical chest movement, trache uh, trachea was centrally uh, located, normal vocal parameters, symmetrical chest expansion, equal bilateral air entry, vesicular breath sounds were present, and there was also normal vocal resonance. The CNS was intact, Glasgow coma scale of 15, motor and sensory were intact, uh, cranial nerves were also intact. So my differential diagnosis was benign prostatic hyperplasia, prostatitis, prostatitis and bladder outlet structures. So the plan was that uh, since 
okay, if there's one thing we, we get from the history is that this patient has been on uh, a, a combination therapy of tamsulosin and finasteride for three years with no or little improvement of the symptoms. So when he was admitted in the ward, the, the doctors had in mind that surgical intervention was necessary at this point. So they, they, what, what they had in mind was that they get a consent for a surgical procedure called the TAP, as I mentioned in my history. Uh, it's called transurectal, uh, trans transurectal, uh, Hello, Najma, we lost you. Hello? Hello? Uh, let me let me try to get in contact with her. Yes, Najma. I'm I'm trying to get in contact with her, um, but okay. you can go ahead okay. and um, give us a few comments about her presentation so far. No, I think it's fine. Let her, let her complete and then she goes to the discussion. It's okay. You're fine. All right, so, so. Unless anyone has a question. Hello. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. I had some more network issues. Okay. Uh, so we were at the plan. So the plan was that uh, they get our consent for the TURP procedure, the transurethral resection of the prostate. Uh, they also do a baseline investigation, that's full hemogram uh, uh, UECs. Uh, they also do a coagulation profile. They do a prostate ultrasound. They do echo. Uh, that's echo. Uh, that's uh, echo. Then there is the prostate specific antigen levels. Uh, this since the patient is, is scheduled for uh, a surgery, they do GXM to uh, see if he matches for blood transfusion. Uh, Neil per oral from midnight before surgery. The surgery, as I mentioned in my HPI, was scheduled. That was today. Yes, today was 21st of uh, June. Uh, the results, the UECs and urine, uh, urine microscopy and sensitive, culture and sensitivity were normal. Full hemogram was normal. Normal coagulation profile. The prostate ultrasound showed the prostate size of eight, as I mentioned. Uh, the prostate uh, specific antigen levels were also normal. They were less than four. For the echo, uh, the, 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 it showed uh, left ventricular ejection fraction of 63%. Uh, so, my final diagnosis was benign prostatic enlargement. And uh, thank you. I welcome any uh, addition additional information that I have left out in my history. I think if there is no question, you can proceed Najma with the discussion and then uh, we shall give a summary at the end. Okay. Okay, so we uh, on the case discussion aspect. 
So I made some few slides on the nine prostatic hyperplasia. There are some things that I'm going to explain, uh, not through the slides. The slides are, I think, they're enough to cover. So if you have your own time, you can go through. But there are some things that I'm going to explain um, without the use of the slides. Uh, okay, so this is the objectives. Okay, I add each and every one of you who is listening to me to at least get one or two, three things from the, these objectives so that when we finish at the end of this case discussion, I want you to go back and say, what did Najma say on the anatomy of the prostate of the gland? What did she mention a bit of the incidence, etiology, pathophysiology, clinical features, and so on? So I want to get, I want to add each and every one of you to be very keen and attentive and pick one or two, three things from here. So on the review of prostate, so we start with uh, reviewing the anatomy of the prostate. <clears throat> So let's start with the anatomical uh, position of the of the of the prostate. It's positioned inferior, inferiorly to the neck of the bladder, and superiorly to the external urethral sphincter. Okay. So okay, I'll be uh, I, sorry I forgot about this. I wanted to divide it, the review of prostate anatomy into four aspects: the growth part, the histology part, the uh, blood supply part, and the the innervation part. So those are four areas that I want to cover uh, in the next few minutes. So the prostate is commonly described as being the size of the walnut. Roughly two thirds of the prostate is glandular in structure and the remaining third is fibromuscular. The gland itself is surrounded by a thin fibrous capsule of the prostate. This is not a real capsule. It rather resembles the thin connective tissue known as adventitia in the large blood vessels. So traditionally, the prostate is divided into four lobes, into anatomical lobes. We have the inferoposterior, the inferolateral, superomedial, and anteromedial, by the urethra, and the ejaculatory ducts as they pass through the organ. However, more important clinically, uh, the histological division of the prostate is into three main zones. We have the central zone, the transitional zone, and the peripheral zone. So the central zone is around it surrounds the, uh, the ejaculatory duct, comprising approximately 25% of the normal prostate volume. Uh, this is where, uh, if you hear of prostate cancer, this is, this is the zone that normally, normally occurs. We have the transitional zone, which is located centrally and surrounds the urethra, comprising approximately 5 to 10% of the normal prostate volume. And this is where our main thing is benign prostatic hyperplasia. It, it's typically uh, occurs here in this zone. And then we have the peripheral zone, which makes up the main body and the gland. So the rest, approximately 65%, is the peripheral zone and is located posteriorly. That was the glandular part. The fibromuscular stroma, also called the fourth zone, is situated anteriorly in the gland. So I don't want to bore you with a bit of that, but I, I believe all of us, we went through uh, anatomy in first year. Uh, let me just do a bit of the vasculature. The arterial supply of the prostate comes from the prostatic arteries, which are mainly derived from the internal iliac arteries. And uh, the venous drainage of the prostate is via the prostatic venous plexus, draining into the internal iliac vessels. The innervation, it receives sympathetic and parasympathetic sensor and sensory innervation from the inferior hypogastric plexus. So that's just a review of the prostate of the anatomy. Now let's go into the real deal. So today's case discussion was benign prostatic hyperplasia. So if you are told to define a, a benign prostatic hyperplasia, how will you say that? So it is a non-cancerous condition, okay? A non-cancerous condition of progressive enlargement of the prostate gland resulting from an increase in the number. I underline that word number. A lot of people mispronounce benign prostatic hypertrophy. It's more of a hyperplasia, more of an enlargement. I want you to pick that one. So is the number, is there is an increase in the number of size of epithelial cells and stromal tissue. It usually occurs after the age of 50 years. So it's more of an age-related condition. So let me bore you with a bit of statistics, the incidence. So how often does uh, a benign prostatic hyperplasia occur? So it affects most men over the age of 50, uh, and only 10% at that year, the age of 50, only 10% will have the symptoms. 
But then as they progress, as someone ages, frequency arises with age after the age of 30. So if, when they reach at the age of 80, you can have a 90% uh, incidence of benign prostatic hyperplasia. So we can have a bit of uh, proportion, 25 to 50% of the men with micro or microscopic evidence of benign uh, prostatic hyperplasia will progress to clinical uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia. So who are these men at risk? Men who are more than 55 years of age with lower upper tract symptoms, such as, I will be mentioning this in my, uh, as we continue to the clinical presentation. So when you hear a lower upper tract symptom, they're normally divided into irritative it's lower symptoms. urinary, lower urinary tract. Sorry, lower urinary tract symptoms is normally divided into irritative and obstructive. So the irritative symptoms, frequency of urination, urgency, nocturia, all these things, and the obstructive symptoms such as hesitancy, poor stream, um, uh, void dribbling, intermittency, as I'll be describing more in this. And if you do a uh, urophilometry, which is the flow chart, uh, the Q max is less than 15 mils per second, or a prostate size of more than 20 grams without cancer. So these men are at high risk of progressing to clinical DPH. So what is the cause of uh, so, what is sorry, the cause Najma, of for, benign sorry, sorry, Najma, for interrupting. Yes, Dr. Harry? You can hear me. Maybe you can spend like a minute uh, per slide so that uh, we can have enough time for discussion and uh, question and answer session. Yes, I'll do that. Just keep a summary of each slide. Thank you. Uh, so for the etiology, so we can have etiology and risk factors. So is at risk of getting uh, benign prostatic hyperplasia. Age is a risk factor that I mentioned. Family history, is there any family history? People with comorbidities such as type 2 DM, hypertension, and heart disease. All these people are at high risk of uh, people with, who have drinking problems, uh, alcohol consumption, smoking. All these people are at high risk of, of, of getting um, benign prostatic hyperplasia. So we can divide our causes into uh, hormonal causes. There's growth factor related causes. Is the aging that I mentioned. So for the hormonal causes, what happens is that uh, in uh, as we age, there is some hormonal alterations. So there'll be an increased testosterone to uh, there'll be an increased conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone via the alpha reduction. And once that happens, this the, the hydrotestosterone will bind to the, uh, the, the androgen receptors within the prostate cells, especially in the transitional zone. And once that happens, there will be uh, upregulation up, up of growth factors such as insulin growth factor, epidermal growth factors. And once these growth factors have been upregulated, there will be stromal proliferation, there will be trunk differentiation, and there will also be an increased uh, uh, extracellular matrix. So this will lead now to an increased mass effect. This will also cause bladder outlet obstruction, which is now due to the mass effect. So that's how the hormones will lead to uh, these symptoms of benign prostatic hyperplasia. The stromal causes, we can have the epithelial interaction theory. So pro proliferation of both the epithelial and stromal components of the prostate with resultant in enlargement of the gland. Uh, we also have some stem cell theory thing. It's more of the same as long as we've gotten the concept as I mentioned, how the hormones is the same thing related. So abnormal maturation and regulation of the cell renewal process. So there'll be more of growth than apoptosis. And once that happens, there'll be an increase in size of the prostate and uh, eventually leading to benign prostatic hyperplasia. The static, so the, the, the obstruction, the prosthetic obstruction is normally divided into static component and dynamic component. The static component is due to mass effect. So you will have voiding symptoms such as hesitancy, weak strain, intermittency, straining. And then for the static effects, for the dynamic effects, it's uh, mainly due to uh, the irritative symptoms, the frequency of urination, uh, the urgency, and the dysphoria, as I mentioned. <clears throat> So all these things you can, it's the same thing that I've been mentioning, you can take your own time and, and go through them. So how does benign prostatic hyperplasia present with? It normally presents as obstructive symptoms and irritative symptoms. So the obstructive symptoms always predominate. So some of them include uh, hesitancy. So hesitancy, hesitancy is difficult to stop the micturation. They will have uh, slow urinary stream. So it's also called weak stream. They will have straining, uh, like 
training to pass during. Uh, they will have uh, intermittency, meaning they start menstruating, then they stop, then they start again. That's intermittency. And then post-void dribbling is uh, like after they are finished uh, menstruating, they will see some drops uh, of, of, of urine soiling their clothes. Incomplete voiding is they have just voided and then after some few time they feel like they have not yet, like they still need to pee again. The irritative uh, symptoms increased frequency, meaning they're going to the bathroom frequently than before. Urgency, they cannot post, they have the intense, uh, they, the intense desire to urinate, but they, and they cannot postpone it. Nocturia, going to the, uh, waking up at night frequently to urinate. Dysuria, staying during urination. So all these are the, the, the symptoms, obstructive symptoms and irritative symptoms. So what are some of the complications of, of, uh, of benign prostatic hyperplasia? You can have hydrouretra, which is dilatation of the ureta because of the backup, you know, uh, uh, there the is high pressure, backup of urine, so they will have hydrouretra. They also have hydronephrasis, which is uh, uh, dilatation of the, of the, of the kidneys, pyronephrasis, uh, which is a uh, bacterial, uh, separative bacterial infection, pyronephritis, acute urinary retention, UTI, stone formation, hernia, secondary to chronic pain. All these are complications that can arise from benign prostatic hyperplasia. As a picture, I have put here a picture, you can see the, uh, there's, uh, there's hydronephrosis, bilateral hydronephrosis, bilateral uh, hydroureta, and even hypertrophic uh, bladder, as you can see that. So what do you need to rule out when you are suspecting a benign prostatic hyperplasia? You need to rule out stricture, bladder neck contractures. You need to rule out uh, chronic constipation, cancer of the bladder neck or cancer of the prostate. You have to rule out neuro neurogenic bladder and other aspects of history. So let's go to the physical examination. What do you need to get from, what do you need to do uh, on the physical aspect? So you need to inspect, you check for the vitals. You won't rule out chronic renal failure. So you want to check for the blood pressure. Is it high? Is it normal? Is it low? You want to check for fever. Is there any fever? Because you want to rule out UTI. Uh, what about the urinary output? Is it within the normal range? So you want to rule out chronic renal, renal failure. Is the patient already on indwelling catheters? So you want to suspect, if you're suspecting acute uh, urine retention, you, you need to uh, rule out that aspect as well. Is the patient on diapers? Is the patient having hematuria, blood in urine? Uh, you also check for the appearance of the patient. Is the patient pale? Because uh, you suspect maybe anemia because of chronic renal failure. If there's underlying malignancy, you want to check for pachygia. Is the patient wasted? You want to rule out cancer. You also want to check for hernia repair scar is uh, because of the chronic uh, training and everything that I mentioned. So you go to the abdomen, you, you palpate, you check for hernias, you do abdominal perineal masses, you do, you, you balance your kidneys, you want to check for any hydronephrosis or pyelonephritis, you want to do a renal punch, you want to palpate the, the bladder, is it tender, is it non-tender, you want to check for pedal or sacral edema because you're suspecting chronic renal failure, is there any body tenderness because you want to rule out tumor. So if you do a DRE, that is for rectal examination or digital rectal examination, you check for impacted stool. And for the prostate, you check for the, is it, is it smooth? Is it symmetrically enlarged? If it's symmetrically enlarged, it's more than three finger bread. Is it nodular? Is, is the median sulcus in intact or it's obliterated? You want to check for the consistency. Is it firm, rubbery-like feeling? You check for the rectal mucosa. Is it smooth? Is it not attached to the prostate? You'll get, you, if you get this slides, you can go on. I've, been, I've, I've explained everything there. Investigations, you start with the blood, full blood count. You want to check, is there any anemia? Is there any raised WBCs? If you're suspecting any infection, you check for the URC, uh, for the U, UEC, UECs. You want to check for dehydration. You want to check for risk, determine if you want to rule out renal impairment. You check for the urinalysis, cytology, urine culture and sensitivity. You check for the prostate uh, specific antigen level. You check for, you do, apart from the baseline investigations, you do an imaging, imaging of the kidney, imaging of the bladder. You want to check uh, the imaging of the ultrasound of the, of the prostate, ultrasound of the bladder, ultrasound of the kidney. You want to check for cystoscopy, pull out stone. You need to do a uroflometer. All these things are in the slides. I think on your own time, you can go through them. So how do you manage your patient? So a patient with high uh, clinical suspicion and confirmation of benign prostatic hyperplasia. You can do 
uh, watchful, watchful waiting, you can do medical management or you can do surgical intervention. So, <clears throat> and from this uh, management, you want to provide rapid and sustained relief of symptoms. You want to prevent long-term complications and you want to improve the patient's quality of life. So these are the three things that you should keep in mind whenever you want to choose a better management plan for your patient. So for watchful waiting, it's suitable for patients with minimal symptoms, no complications and normal investigation. So you monitor the patient's symptoms over time and clinical costs. Uh, for the pharmacological therapy, we have the alpha blockers and we have the five alpha reductive uh, inhibitors. So for the alpha blockers, the alpha adrenergic blockers, we have the selective and non-selective. But because of minim minimal side effects, we normally go for the uh, selective. So prazosine, terazosine, samtolosine, alfazosine, those are the main alpha one adrenergic blockers. So for them to be effective, it takes three days. And these are the first line therapy treatment of symptoms. So what they do is that they block the alpha-1 adrenergic receptors in the blood and neck. And once, it, uh, once the, uh, the, the, what do you call the, uh, these drugs, they, are, they, they immediately uh, relax the blood and neck so urine can flow uh, uh, very well. So uh, that's what they do. They decrease outflow resistance and decrease blood instability. So we have, uh, we, normally, we normally don't use these drugs alone. We normally combine them. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you more a bit in, in, uh, in, the, in the coming slides. So for the side effects, you can have postural hypotension, you can have dizziness, lethargy, lightness. but these symptoms are well tolerated. Uh, for the alpha, for, for the five alpha reductase inhibitors, which is fenesteride and, uh, and glutasteride, so what they do is that they treat the disease. For this one, for the five, the, uh, the alpha blockers, what they do is that they treat the symptoms only. But for the five alpha reductase inhibitors, they treat the disease, not just the symptoms, by inhibiting the conversion of testosterone to the direct testosterone by the alpha reductase uh, enzyme. So this will lead to reduced prostate size. So it's pro, uh, it takes three to six months to be effective. and may even require long-term maintenance. So it can only be effective after six months. Uh, and uh, yeah, it normally takes uh, effective after six months. So some of the adverse effects include decreased libido, so the patient may complain of erectile dysfunction. Uh, they might have ejaculatory dysfunction. They might have impotence and even gynecomastia. So the surgical intervention. So who is uh, who is eligible for surgery? If the patient comes to you through the outpatient clinic and they and you suspect a benign prostatic atresia, you just you don't immediately say that this patient is, is eligible for surgery. So who is eligible for for surgery? So if there is failure of medical treatment, so if uh, like for a patient, for in our case, he has been he has been on combination therapy, uh, alpha one and five alpha reductase inhibitors, both of them for three years, and there's no or little improvement with symptoms. So that's kind of failure. If there's if there's deterioration of upper tract, so maybe there's a complication of hydronephrosis, hydroureter, and those things. If the prostate is more than 30 grams, or uh, PC, uh, prostate specific antigen levels of more than 2.5, is that patient is eligible for surgery. If there's significant post void residual of more than 50, if there's low flow rate, and if the patient wants to, like if the patient choice he wants to, he wants to do uh, uh, because of to improve his quality of life. He wants to do a surgical management. So, what are the possible surgical interventions we have here? We have transuretral resection of the prostate (TRP). This is the most popular method or today. Uh, what they do is that a resectoscope is passed through the urethra and 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 the, and the division with constant irrigation with water or lighting. The prostate is resected into multiple pieces and removed. So the excess prostate tissue is removed. That's in short, that's what it's saying here. So what are the advantages? Post-operative recovery is smooth and rapid. Incontinence is rare because of the chances of damage to the internal skin are very low. The advantage is that because of uh, there is uh, the TAP syndrome, the TRP syndrome with water intoxication, patients might suffer from hyponatremia, and there is uh, there is uh, diverticuli and stone are at high risk. The patients might get that. Another another surgical intervention is transvesical suprapubic prostatectomy. 
this method is now restricted to blend more than 100 grams in weight and associated with calculus. So the disadvantages is that the structure of the prostatic urethra might occur. Chances of hemorrhage are more. Blind resection also occurs. So other, other surgical interventions include the prostatectomy, prostatectomy, done by extraterritorial approach without opening the bladder, pushing the bladder to one side and excision of the, of the prostate. This is the most, pref uh, this also preferred more than perineal uh, prostatectomy because of less uh, hemorrhage and less complication. Perineal prostatectomy is now obsolete because we have advanced, uh, uh, we have advanced surgical interventions such as uh, the TURPs. So we, we hardly do uh, perineal prostatectomy uh, nowadays. Some of uh, some other surgical interventions I've not mentioned here include bladder neck incision, thermal therapy, cryotherapy, balloon dilatation, uh, transurethral needle ablation of the of the prostate, transurethral microwave thermal therapy. All these things are also there. So, but I think I'll I'll I will leave it at that point. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Najma, for that uh, wonderful presentation. Uh, good history and a uh, good presentation. <clears throat> so, is there any question from the uh, listeners? Anyone with a question or you want to ask something or anything which is not clear? Anyone? Uh, Wa alaikum salam wa barakatuh. Uh, first of all, uh, <clears throat> I want to thank you for, for joining us. I really appreciate you. I also want to thank the presenters and the organizers. My I have two questions. I'll be very brief. Now, can you hear me? Yes, yes. So my first question is uh, regarding the IPSS score. Yes. Uh, is it a screening tool or a prognostic tool? Because sometimes you can have patients who have uh, uh, very high scores, but then the quality of life is good. So, uh, does can you can someone use the IPSS score uh, uh, to know if the patient uh, needs a QRP or not? And then the second question: Our patient has a com uh, our patient is hypertensive, and he is on tamsulosin uh, today. Tamsulosin is an alpha one selective blocker, mm -hmm. but then it's usually a selective alpha one B selective to the uh, prostate as compared to the other uh, alpha-1 selective antagonists, mm -hmm. which also do inhibit uh, the vascular. So uh, if our patient is hypertensive, uh, should we use uh, the other types of alpha-1 selective antagonists like uh, terazosmin, doxazosmin, prazosmin, in combination with uh, finasteride rather than tamsulosine, so that you can also decrease the number of drugs that the patient is taking from a therapeutic point. So okay. Thanks. Anyone who wants to address those questions? Okay, so regarding the IPS score, you can hear me? Can no, you hear no. me? I can hear you. Yes, can okay, hear you. so the IPS score initially is a tool which is used to quantify the severity of symptoms, which uh, traditionally is used to group whether the patient requires a watchful waiting whether they require medical treatment or whether it's a candidate for surgery, but you cannot use IPSS alone to take the patient to theater because you have to get the patient as a whole. Patient has come, you know, this IPSS also is subjective, although it's, try, it's, it's meant to be objective because it's being categorized from zero to five, but uh, this is what the patient tells you. So you have to quantify. This patient is telling you, Dr. when I go to pee, I don't finish my urine. So you have to do an ultrasound to check for the post-void volume. Because if you find the post-void volume is zero, then it means there's a discrepancy because the patient is telling you, I cannot finish my urine, but the post-void is 10 mils. It means the patient is emptying the blood well. But if the patient is telling you, I can't finish my urine, and then you do an ultrasound, it tells you the post-void is 150, then you know this is serious. So always interpret the PSA in the context of the patient presentation and other uh, investigations which quantify the, the PSA, like those post void volume, the PSA, the Q max, all these things can be used as surrogate markers. They are called surrogate markers for, for IPSS. So basically, it's just to know where we are starting. A patient has come to the clinic, I have nocturia, 
I have urgency, frequency, straining. You will score him. This patient is 20. Okay, he has moderate symptoms. Let us check his prostate size. What is the size of the prostate? Okay, because that can give you an idea. And also the, the morphology of the prostate, because in neurology, there's a saying that the size of the prostate may not correspond or correlate with the degree of obstruction. The size of the prostate may not correlate with the degree of the obstruction, meaning someone can have a relatively large prostate, okay, but with severe symptoms. And another one has a bigger prostate with mild symptoms. It's possible to have that. It depends on how that prostate enlarges. Is it the median lobe is getting into the bladder wall? Are the lateral lobes kissing each other? So that is so important to know the morphology. And actually for, for, for you as uh, training doctors, when you see an ultrasound of the prostate, don't rush to read the report because most of the time it is false. Look at the images yourself. Turn to the second page and look at the films and look at the anatomy or the morphology of the prostate. That will give you an idea of how bad or how severe the symptoms are. On the other hand, also the IPSS can be used to monitor the patient post-op because patient has come with an IPSS of 20 or 30, or may find a TORP. After one month, you want to know what is the IPSS will go down to five or less than five. If the IPSS is still high, it means the job is unfinished. So these IPSS can also be used to follow the patient post-op because it should significantly reduce after you have done a surgical intervention. Otherwise, it is useless to do a surgical intervention if the IPSS is high because BPH is a disease of quality of life. So once you have done a surgical intervention, the quality of life should improve and that is, should be reflected from the IPSS score. The other question was on uh, uh, alpha blockers. The reason why we don't use kinaterazosine, prazosine, because these are non-selective. Alpha blockers are found, alpha receptors are found mainly on the blood vessels. So if you use an unselective alpha blocker, you will uh, antagonize, block all the alpha receptors in the body and the blood vessel will suffer the first ones. And that's why they will cause a significant drop in the blood pressure, orthostatic hypotension, and that's why they were abandoned. So these days we use super selective or uroselective alpha blockers, which only act at the blood and egg, prostate, and the, uh, the, the, the receptors around the uh, capsule of the prostate with minimal effect on the, on the alpha receptors found in the blood vessels. That's why they have minimal that uh, side effect of uh, that orthostatic hypotension, okay? I hope I have answered your question. Or oh, you have any other question? Uh, thank you. You've answered my question. But I have a final question, Dr. Yes. Uh, when it comes to clinical assessment, uh -huh. uh, if we compare digital, rect uh, if you compare rectal examination uh -huh. and uh, prostate ultrasound, which one is superior? Because uh, three weeks ago, there is a patient that I saw a uh, 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 prostate ultrasound report two prostate ultrasound reports that were five days apart. The first one was saying that uh, everything is normal, everything is good, even the postvoidal uh, volume was okay. And then the second one, the prevoidal, uh, the prevoid and the postvoid was almost equal. So this was done five days ago. And we know that ultrasound uh, is usually, usually depends to the sonographer. So do, uh, can someone rely on DRE rather than post ultrasound. Okay, the question is you need both of them, okay? In the clinic first, when you see the patient, you have to do a digital exam. And for you, especially as the practicing doctors, you must train your fingers how to touch the prostate. That one you cannot escape, especially if you want to go into the field of surgery or urology. It is important to train your finger how to feel for the prostate. How does the prostate feel, okay? how to palpate for the median sulcus, how to feel for the consistency, how to estimate the size, okay? Because there are two ways you can, you see when you put your finger on the rectum to palpate the prostate, you can start from the base up to where you can reach at the top. So you like take your finger like this. So you estimate how many fingers can you put there? Okay, how many fingers can fit that space? Is it three fingers or four fingers? I'm not saying you put three fingers in, into the rectum. No, you just put a finger and then you estimate. So one finger, a finger breath is 20 cc. So you estimate if you go uh, over the prostate from the base to the apex, and you can you feel that here, it can fit about uh, four finger breath, that's a prostate which is 80 cc. If it is going more than uh, four fingers or you cannot go above the prostate, 
it means most likely that prostate is enlarged more than HECC, it's 100 and above, okay? So that's one way of estimating it. And then now you need to correlate now when the ultrasound is done, you see now the morphology of the prostate. And this is where the big problem is because uh, the sonographers have to be trained on how to do an ultrasound. Today, I returned a patient in the clinic. He brought me an ultrasound for, of the prostate. You can see the prostate is so enlarged, is, is protruding into the blood that is looking like, like a head, head of a fetus. And the sonographer is saying normal prostate. So I said, go back to the sonographer. You must write a, another report. And he came back, the prostate markedly enlarged, HACC. Now you can imagine. This patient will have been sent home on nothing, but now, the report is saying the process is significantly enlarged and now it's protruding into the bladder. So the patient may require surgical intervention. So you have to be very careful. That's why I told you, do not, as a student, do not read the report. First, look at the films of yourself. Train your eye how to interpret the film. And then now you, you with, with, a, with, with a very careful eye, you read the report and then you compare. That way you will not be uh, caught off guard with, the, with, with, the, with those reports. So you need both the DRE and the, and the ultrasound so that you can correlate the, and treat the patient well. But this one will come with experience because you guys right now, you just rotate for three weeks or four weeks. Once you stay in, an area, in, a, in, a, in a place for quite some time, if you invest a lot of time in it, then you will learn it. It requires a, a bit of time on it. Any other question? Have I answered your question? Can, I, can you have another question from any other person? Hello, you can hear me? Yes, 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 you can hear you, Dr. Shukran. Thank you so much. Have I answered your question? Yes, 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 yes. Okay. Any other person who wants to ask a question or clarify something? Najma. Najma, are you yes. there? Yes, yeah. Any question on, on what you have read? Any question? Any question or clarification? Mm, not really. Yeah, there's a, there's a question. Uh, there was a recent report I was reading on uh, prostatic embolization, artery embolization, prostate artery embolization. Is that a procedure, a new procedure that's in the field right now? Okay, that one is not common. And uh, that one mainly is done for big glands, which probably cannot uh, undergo these minimally invasive procedures, or in cases where there's bleeding from the from the prostate where you cannot control the bleeding, maybe you can do that minimally invasive for artery embolization. But that is something which is still under investigation. It's not, uh, it has not yet passed the clinical trials to be used in clinical practice. But it can be done in special settings where you have, want to do minimally invasive uh, uh, to basically shrink the prostate and kill the blood supply and basically induce apoptosis. Okay, oh, thank you. Any other question? Yes, Dr. There's a question yes. in the chat box. Yeah, just ask. Uh -huh. um, I want to ask a slightly um, deviate to prostate please, CA please. in relation to BPH. Eh? You can hear me? Uh -huh. Yes. Okay. I'm asking, first, my first question is uh, on, on DRE, will you please maybe kindly briefly tell us how to differentiate uh, BPH and maybe, maybe any other finding in uh, prostate CA? And also, um, I don't know if it is true, but I read somewhere that uh, many of the patients when uh, who actually uh, have prostates here when they're presenting, they present at a later stage. So my question is, um, if that is true, um, is there like, a, you see the way we do for cervical cancer in women, we encourage them to be going for regular pap smears uh, to check and uh, have a risk stratification strategy. Is that also the same for men? Are they uh, encouraged to be going for maybe ultrasound or anything to just uh, make sure that they're not uh, going into prostate here. Thank the you. first question was on what? The difference, uh, how to differentiate BPH. Yes, and yes, yes. On, yes, on DR. yes. So uh, in, in benign, usually they, they say, if, you, if, if this is your hand, clench your hand, okay? Make a fist. Can you see the thinner eminence? Okay, if you, if you make a fist, palpate your thinner eminence. You see, it's going inside, okay? That is the consistency of a benign prostate, all right? And then look at the knuckles, these knuckles, touch, the, touch your knuckles. This is now the consistency of the 
cancerous spot is hard. Usually it's hard. It's a, it has a hard consistency. This one, they say it has, has a rubbery, soft and rubbery consistency. So just make a fist, thinner eminence, the consistency is benign, and the knuckles, that is a hard consistency. Usually sometimes you can have nodules, you can palpate nodules. The median sulcus might be obliterated, okay? So that one is just to give you an idea because again, a digital rectal exam, it can miss 30% of clinically significant cancers. So you have to get the patient into context. This is an elderly man, he's above 70 years. He has come with low attack symptoms. What is his PSA? Okay, PSA is, say is above 20. Okay, he has, he's complaining of low backache, severe low backache, all right? And then on DRE, it is hard and then it is nodular. You cannot feel the median sulcus that is very suspicious for prostate cancer and therefore you have to do a biopsy. But biopsy is not done blindly on, on, on all the patients. You have to you know, risk stratify the patient and then know which one is suggestive of cancer or not. There are many parameters you can do that. And the other question was on, uh, the other question was on what? Should we be doing? Uh, screening. Yeah, mm, the question screen on screening. So it is very controversial. That is one of the most controversial topics in the field of urology and oncology is about screening for prostate cancer. Because there are two types of prostate cancer. There are those cancers which are indolent. It means they, are, they grow slowly and they will take about 10 to 15 to 20 years for them to manifest. And most likely they will not kill the patient. All right? So, you know, prostate cancer is a disease of elderly men above the age of 60, 70 years, okay? And most of these men are diabetic and hepatitis as you have seen in this patient, all right? Most of these patients are diabetic, but they have, all, they have cardiovascular problems. So these cancers which are indolent and they are slow growing, the patient will most likely die from other cardiovascular problems than the prostate cancer. So these kind of patients, we don't uh, go actively looking for the cancer. However, there are also other group of patients who have uh, very aggressive cancers, okay? Very aggressive cancers, probably familial cancers who require early diagnosis and treatment. So you cannot throw a blanket statement and say, all men above the age of 50 years should go for prostate cancer screening. No, because if you do that, you will diagnose cancers which do not require treatment and the patient will be anxious and they'll be subjected to some form of treatment which have side effects. The problem with prostate cancer is that any intervention done on prostate cancer, whether it is surgical or radiotherapy or chemotherapy, it has severe adverse effects on the patient. It can lead the patient to incontinence. It can lead to sexual dysfunction, okay? And other side effects. So the, the, in other words, the side effects are unbearable. So we only want to treat those patients who de deserve the treatment. And those now you can really stratify them based on the grade of the cancer they have, okay? If there's any familial history of, of cancer, the PSA, usually they are grading system. One is called the Diamico grading system, okay? And other many grading systems which are used to grade these patients. So in other words, every case needs to be discussed on a case-to-case -case basis, but you cannot throw a general statement and say you screen all men above the age of 60 for, for prostate cancer, because that will lead to over-treatment and over-treatment will lead to side effect. Okay, it's like, you know, killing a mosquito with a, with a very big machete. So that one will be a waste of energy and resources. Thank you, thank you, doctor. Yes, 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 shukran. Okay. Any other question? Any other question or clarification? <laughs> Najma, can you go to, to the slide? Uh, the the uh, clinical history, the history, the history part. Najma, are you there? Yes, Dr. Give me a minute. Which page? Next, just go next. I'll just put in the, in the chat box. Okay, so just go, go to the first, first, just first, first slide. Okay. The other, the other one, the other one. Biodata. 
Oh, by data. Yes. Okay, okay so just in, in, in a quick way, maybe about 10 minutes should be done. So, because I think the best way to dissect, to, to learn from this uh, is to learn from the real life scenario of this patient, okay? So these statements here have important some of them. So this is a 70 year old, as you can see, this is an elderly man, okay? And uh, this is the age group where they most likely present with those symptoms and they are more likely to have those episodes of urinary retention, okay? Next. Next. So this patient has been suffering for three years, okay? So the take home message here, do not treat a patient with BPH on medical treatment for more than 12 months. Maximum should go, it should be about 18 months, but even that is, is, is too high. 12 months, if the patient has not responded for, for, for one year, so what is the plan? Because now the patient is going to suffer for all these years. This medical therapy, if the patient has not responded in one year, go to the next level of management. Because if you leave the patient like this with a urinary retention and on catheters, it is going to have a reversible damage on the bladder. Even if you do TRP three years down the line, the patient will, is going to have what is called overactive bladder, okay? Or they can have even an atonic bladder. In other words, they will, know, they will have those symptoms of incontinence or the bladder might refuse to contract, okay? So BPH is a disease of the quality of life, but it can have significant impact on other organs of the urinary system. So if the patient was responded within 12 months on medical treatment and you are sure the patient is compliant, then move to the next level of management, okay? Patient should not stay for, 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 more than, for more than a year on medical treatment. Actually, if the patient has not responded for one year, that one is called failed medical treatment. And that is the most common indication for TRP these, these days, okay? and especially in the Western world, the most common indication is failed medical treatment. Patient has been on medication for a year, and as long as they are compliant and they have not responded, go to the next level of management. Okay, and you can see there for three years, we lead to a low improvement syndrome, so you should not wait for three years. Next. And then just go back a bit. They say the prostate size is there. So again, you see, uh if it is really true if it is really true that this patient has a process size of 68 and he has been on phenocene for three years and he has not responded then there is a problem there because things are not tying up okay because uh this combination therapy should take down this you know the, the if you use combination it takes down 25 percent of the process in the first one year the 25 percent should be gone so unless the patient is not taking the drug or this is 68 is not the, the, the right size. You see now the discrepancy which is coming. So that's why you have to see your, yourself. You have to do a DRE yourself, look at the other one yourself, and then make the judgment. Unless the patient is not taking the medication, all this process size is false. Because today, there was a patient who came to the clinic. He has been on uh, this phenocin, okay? Another drug called Duodad, but it's the same is Dutasteride instead of Finasteride and Tamsulosin. He took it for about two years. His process size was 60, and today he came back 15. So I told him, you are cured, my friend. Thank God, and go home, continue with your life, okay? But uh, if this is the case, which is not uh, telling, then you have to ask yourself why. Next. Okay, so this patient is hypertensive and is on three medications. He's on a beta blocker an ACE inhibitor and a calcium channel blocker, all right? So the blood pressure must be very well controlled because especially if they're going for process surgery, the process can bleed after, after surgery. So you must make sure for these patients, you, they are normotensive. And then you, you have to do a cardiac evaluation like an echo so that uh, when you give them the spinal, they don't have complication of heart problems intra-op because some of them they can get heart attack, they can arrest. So you must make sure, because these are these of elderly men, and most of them have these complications. So you must make sure they are controlled before the patient goes to theater, because this is an elective procedure, it's not an emergency. So make sure everything is fine before the patient goes in. Next. So this nocturia, eh? nocturia, those men, 
who have experienced nocturia, they say it is worse than angina. Nocturia is worse than angina, that's what they say. And nocturia is also associated with overall cardiovascular health. The, it has been shown that patients who have severe nocturia, most likely they will die from these other cardiovascular problems. So nocturia is a very important thing that you must pick up from the history and it must be addressed. And this patient, uh, you see, is wearing adult diapers. You know why? What, what, what do you think, uh, Najma? What do you think the patient was put on diapers? Can you hear us, Najma? Yes, yes, I can. Hey, what do you think? Why, why, why do you think the patient was put on diapers? You don't have incontinence? What kind of incontinence? Arch. Is Arch plus? Arch and plus overflow. Okay? Overflow. Over, there's something called overflow incontinence. It is like you take a glass of water and a jug and then you pour the water on the glass. It will get full, full until it will pour down. It's like that. It's called overflow incontinence. Okay? When, when, if a patient reaches that level, you should not discuss medical treatment. That patient requires surgical intervention because the blood, the detrusor is going to give way, basically, because the prostate, the, the, the bladder is contracting against the resistance until the detrusor is weak and it's going to be replaced with fibrous tissue. So part of the uh, mucosa is going to herniate through the detrusor muscle. You need longer trabeculations and diverticulation, diverticular, basically. So that one is irreversible when it reaches that stage. And that's why even if you remove the prostate, the patient will continue to have incontinence for the rest of his life. Or the bladder might even refuse to contract. So the patient will be on an indwelling catheter in and out. That's why you should not reach this level. Next. Okay, next. You see the multiple, however, there's a history of urethral instrument on multiple occasions. You see that statement? Can, can you see that statement, all of you? However, there is a history of urethral instrument on multiple occasions. So normally, if a patient present in casualty with acute urinary retention due to an enlarged prostate, you are allowed to catheterize and start the patient with medical treatment, okay? And then try a trial without catheter maybe after about three weeks or four weeks. If you remove the catheter from that patient and the patient has another episode of retention, take the patient to, to, to theater, okay? Don't do another attempt until they get multiple attempts of urine retention, because these are damaging the upper tracts and they're damaging the bladder. So early intervention is very important. Next. 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 So, sorry, go back a bit. And go back a bit. Yes, you see, IPSS was 25 out of 35. So, what severity score is that, Najma? Severe. Eh? When do we start to say patient has severe symptoms? When the score is more than 20? When the score is more than 18, more than 19. Okay. Any IP is a score of more than 19, that is severe symptoms. Okay. Zero to eight is mild. More than eight is moderate up to 19. More than 19 is uh, severe symptoms. But I say this is not a sole indicator for taking the patient for surgery. You can start on treatment, the patient might respond, but now look at the other markers. What is the size of the prostate? What's the PSA score level? Okay, well, how is the anatomy or the morphology of the prostate? The age of the patient, the Q marks, all these things can help you to make a decision. Next. <coughs> Next. I think you have gone a bit fast. There's something I'm, okay. Okay, that's fine. Uh -huh. Next. 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 
Next. Here yeah, you should have done a diary yourself. Next. I'll do it next time. Inshallah. Next. By the way, the most important physical examination on a patient with BPH is, is DRE. Okay, so that one you should not, and if you get a patient like this in the exam, you must make sure, the, Professor Daguada says, if you cannot put your hand, put your foot. Of course, it doesn't mean you put your foot, but to stress the importance. Next. Next. Look at the PSA. I, I, what can you say about that PSA, Najma? Is that normal? It's normal, yes. Why? And this patient has been suffering for the last uh, three years with the multiple history of urinary retentions and catheters. Why do we have a PSA of two? Is it a lab error or that's how it should be? Lab error, maybe. Huh? No, I want to now, I want, because you, you have read, that's why I'm asking you, you have done a literature review. Why does this patient with a process size of 68 mils from the ultrasound report, by the way, this patient, have, did you see the patient before the surgery? Yes. Did he have a catheter? Yes. He had a urethro catheter? Yes. Okay, so why, does the, why is the PSA 2 at 2? Why is it within normal? Anyone who wants to attempt, anyone in, this, in, the, in the audience? Do you know the PSA of this patient three years ago, three years before? What was the initial PSA from the file? No, it wasn't there. You didn't see it anywhere, uh, PSA, the earlier PSA? Yeah, I, I, I was unable to retrieve. Okay, so this PSA is not surprising because this patient has been on finasteride for three years. If you take finasteride for 12 months, it cuts the PSA by 50%. You understand? If you take finasteride for 12 months, it will reduce the PSA by 50%. So most likely this patient, the PSA is too because it has been on long-term finasteride. Okay, that's why the, the, the PSA is, 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 is reduced like this. Okay, next. Okay. <clears throat> that's the last slide. Yeah. So I think uh, I think if we if if we dissect the history like that, because now it's practical, you see the patient, this is a real patient who presented like this, then now it's easier to remember. Okay. Is there any other question? Is there a take home message? Have you gotten a take home message? Uh, the, there are some questions here in the chat box. Uh -huh. uh, so, does the resection, so, so Abdurrahman is asking, does the resection cause any problem in sexual function? Okay, let me answer that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So I'll answer one by one. So when you do a prostate resection, by the way, and this one, you, have you seen it being done? Not really. Yeah, next time when you have a um, saoon camp, uh, you can book these patients uh, for, for BPH eh? and you can come and do the TRP wherever they are, inshallah. So when you do the TRP, you, it's good to avoid the bladder neck because you said in the anatomy of the prostate that uh, above it is the internal sphincter of the bladder at the level of the bladder neck. You know, above the prostate is the bladder. Between the prostate and the bladder, there is a junction there. It's called the bladder neck. That bladder neck, there's a sphincter there, which is called the internal sphincter. It's involuntary. Its work is to contract for the sperm to come out through the penis. So when you do a TRP and you undermine or you cut that uh, fibers of that internal sphincter, it will remain open. And therefore, when sperms come through the ejaculatory duct, the sperm, they like to take a shortcut. So they'll measure what distance is short. Is it from the process to the bladder? or the prostate to the urethra at the tip of the glands. Of course, it's from the prostate to the bladder. So they will go to the bladder. So the patient will have what is called retrograde ejaculation. Instead of sperms going downwards into the penis and out of the urethra, they will go upwards into the bladder. So that's called retrograde ejaculation. So the patient will have that. 
and uh, it's important, especially in young men about, about 55 years who want to have children because you cannot achieve pregnancy if you have retrograde ejaculation. So you have to tell the patient before the TRP that this could be a possible side effect. Otherwise, they can come and see that you have vasectomized them or you have virilized them. Kumbet is the side effect of the TRP. Next. Is that clear? Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's very clear. Uh, does lack of intercourse, does lack of intercourse increase the risk of BPH? That one is a dog, but I, I, that, that, that is not true. It's not scientifically proven. Okay, that one is not scientifically proven because you have seen from the theory of BPH, is uh, those those theories you have mentioned there about the cascade of events, cellular proliferation, lack of apoptosis. Okay. So those things have nothing to do with sexual intercourse. That, that, is, uh, that is usually a, a, a misconception. Maybe in some people, they think that when you have a BPH, you should marry a younger wife, which is not true. Actually, BPH can cause, uh, when the process is enlarged, it can actually impair sexual function because most patients with BPH have sexual problems, okay? Because of those erectile nerves and all those things. So it's not uh, scientifically proven. Uh... Someone is asking, what is, the, what is the role of orchidectomy in the treatment of BPH? There is no role of orchidectomy in the treatment of BPH. Orchidectomy is only done when you have advanced prostate cancer to deprive the cancer cells of uh, testosterone because the fuel, the fuel for prostate cancer is testosterone. Just like us, you can't drive a car without putting petrol. So prostate cancer cannot grow without testosterone. So if you want to stop the prostate cancer, cut the testosterone. And there are two ways you can achieve that. You can either do pharmacological castration or surgical castration. This surgical castration is what is called orchiectomy. But the BPH is a disease of the College of Love is benign. Okay, it's benign. So you can treat it either with uh, medical therapy as you have seen combination therapy, or you can do uh, surgery to remove the prostate. But the tests are innocent. You leave them alone in this case. So ectomy uh, should never so ectomy should never be done on BPH. Doctor, just before you answer the next question. Yes. Uh, three years ago we had a um, sound medical camp, huh? so most yes. of the patients who had loose we were doing PSS. So some of the patients yes. said uh, some of the patients said that PSS cause of more than hundred. Uh -huh. At that time we could not quantify PSA of more than hundred, uh -huh. and uh, so. Uh, the next step is was obviously to do a biopsy, but then uh, yes. the camp was happening in a poor resource setting. We could not do biopsy, yeah. So and then uh -huh. we didn't have a urologist on board. So what we were doing is uh, the general surgeons were doing radical prostatectomy with orchidectomy. Then is it a short uh, circuit? Uh, is it something that you can say uh, it could be implemented in poor resource settings or uh, it's not allowed? When it comes to the practice of urology. So when you have such a case, uh, it is good to refer because you, you know you cannot remove someone testicle based on a clinical suspicion. There has to be a tissue diagnosis, and this is only for, also for medical legal purposes. And you know other labs, uh, you cannot just trust the PSA the way it is. You have to look at the patient as a whole, palpate the prostate do the PSA and confirm the diagnosis of prostate cancer before you subject the patient. You know, orchiectomy is irreversible. That's the problem with orchiectomy. And that's why it was abandoned. These days, rarely people practice orchiectomy, okay? Because it is irreversible. An African man does not want his testicle to be removed, okay? So you have to have at least a backup with the tissue diagnosis. Once you do a prostate biopsy, even if it is just two cause and you prove that this is cancer, okay? And it's also good to stage the cancer. So you cannot jump and, uh, and remove someone testicle because it's irreversible. Once you remove it, it's, uh, that's it, okay? What if about is done later and then it shows it's prostatitis? Because we have seen some cases of uh, uh, PSA is elevated too much above 100, but still the histology is benign. So how will you defend yourself there? And then the other thing, when the, if, you, if, if you're suspecting cancer, you cannot do... Uh, uh, like an open prostatectomy, like uh, to inoculate the prostate, you have to do radical. You cannot do like the one for BPH. Radical is a long procedure, which takes about four to five hours. It involves the reconstruction, removal of the seminal vesicle. It's basically an oncological surgery, which is best done at uh, 
refer hospitals on someone who is experienced. So that one is difficult to do it in a, in a, in a resource poor setting because the patient can suffer the consequences after that now. Actually, if it is done like in an open way to enucleate the prostate and leave the capsule there, it will actually upstage the disease. If you do that, it will actually take the disease to T4. That's why it's very difficult to manage it without backup of lab and, and histology. I don't know if I've answered your question. Uh, yes, yes, you've answered it, thank you. Yeah, maybe next time when we go there, we can go with our biopsy guns and all the machinery and the armamentarium so that whatever case we get, we'll be able to tackle it. I think that would be the best way. Um, okay, Professor, thank you, Dr. Uh, Professor, Salam alaikum. Uh, salam, Hamid one, Hamid. Uh, Yunis here. Yes, Yunis. Uh, some of us can't call you Hamid. Anyway, uh, so I, I had a question concerning uh, uh, whether to use uh, the combination or just uh, tamsulosin because I've seen, I've had a few patients where I use tamsulosin uh, with uh, BPH, then the patient, uh, tam, uh, the first of all, phenocin, and then the patient comes, complains of uh, a bit of erectile dysfunction, a bit of, uh, uh, what is the word, impotence, then uh, change to tamsulosin, they are better, but the, the symptoms go away. Is there any literature that says, uh, the combination is better than uh, the alpha the the uh, that that zosin group. That is a very good question. Eunice, you're doing which cause? Uh, I'm in neuro. Oh, okay. So there's M tops and uh, there's another combat. Yeah. Now there are two trials. Eh? One yeah. is called M tops and the other one is called combat trials. M tops and combat trials. These trials okay. were done in the UK and the USA to compare okay. between monotherapy with tamsulosin or combination therapy with tamsulosin and finasteride. Okay. And they say that any patient with a prostate size of more than 40 grams yeah. will benefit from a combination therapy. Okay. Go for six months, uh, combination therapy. After six months, you drop the tamsulosin because its work has, is done. After six okay. months, it's useless to continue the patient with tamsulosin. It worked so you drop the finasteride, sorry. Yes. After you drop the finasteride or you drop the tamsulosin? You drop the tamsulosin. Okay. So you continue with finasteride after that? Yeah, you continue with finasteride and the peak, okay. finasteride reaches peak at nine months. Okay. So the, you have to tell the patient that you will not see the change in the significant size of the prostate and the symptom score until after six months because it takes six to nine months for the finasteride to work. Once okay. it has worked, it has to be maintained for another about one to two years. Okay. For one to one and a half years to have a maximum okay. impact. So for okay. patients with a process size of less than 40, yeah. and they have these uh, low in attack symptoms, you yeah. can start them on tamsulosin monotherapy. Okay. If you have to give the patient a combination therapy of tamsulosin and uh, finasteride, yeah. then the current literature says you have to add a PDE5 inhib inhibitor, phosphodiesterase type 5, the, the, the Tadalafil, Sildenafil, Vardenafil, those ones, the vasodilators, okay. to counter the importance and the erectile dysfunction. Okay. You understand? Yes. So, so when you, if you prescribe to a sexually active man uh, combination therapy, you yes. have to tell him this thing will cause loss of libido and erectile dysfunction. Are you okay with that? If he says yes, continue. If he says no, I'm not okay with that, then add him a phosphodiesterase inhibitor type 5 which is sildenafil, tadalafil, or vardenafil. That one has been shown to reduce the incidence of impotence, and it also increases the urinary flow rate. It reduces the IPS score also. Okay, um, and in terms, of, in terms of how they, they will take the phosphodiesterase 5, do they, do they take daily? Do they yes, take, that's, a good uh, question. that's a good question. The phosphodiesterase 5, the best in the market right now is called tadalafil. Okay. Because... First of all, it is low dose. If you compare Tadalafil and Sildenafil, yeah. Tadalafil comes in five milligrams. Sildenafil uh, comes in 50 milligrams. 50, yes. Uh, 50, 100. And then uh. Tadalafil, it, can, it, it, uh, it picks up to 36 hours. This okay. other one, I think, is less than 12 hours. And then in terms of side effect profile, the Sildenafil yeah. has more side effect profile compared to Tadalafil, and it has also more full interaction than Tadalafil. 
Okay. So the one which has the best favorable toxicity profile and side effect profile is tadalafil. It, has, okay. it comes in five milligrams and 20 milligrams. So you can okay. start with low dose, five milligrams nocte. Okay. Of PRN, you can give it PRN for a month. Okay. If the patient does not respond on five milligram, then you can go to 20 milligram, but this one, they skip two days. They take today, they skip two days, and then they take the following day like that. Okay. And remember, these phosphodiesterase type five inhibitors, they are vasodilators. They are yes. vasodilators. Yeah. Therefore, if the patient is also taking other vasodilators to treat hypertension, you need to be careful. Okay. Because you overdose the patient with vasodilators and it can cause uh, 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 hypertension. Yeah. Hypertension and those angina. Okay. This one happened, I think, in one of the African president who was taking sildenafil and also he was also taking antihypertensive. So when he was having intercourse, he passed on. And that's oh. why they say this thing killed him. Kumbe was taking two vasodilators. Okay, so that okay. one can cause significant drop in blood pressure, and that one can it can it can have severe cardiovascular adverse effects. If the patient okay. has an underlying heart problem, it can take him down. So you have okay. to check in the medication. Like our patient was on amlodipine, so you have to be careful when you give another vasodilator. Okay, is that clear? Very. Thank you so much. Any other question? There are some questions still in the chat box. Uh, someone is asking, what do you say about the combination of tadalafil? I believe you have answered yes, that one yes. quite well. Yes. yes. Uh, is it true that increase in frequency of ejaculation reduces the chances of BPH? That's the same thing with uh, with uh, the one for the sexual... Uh, is the same, there's no scientific evidence for that. There's no scientific evidence for that. Okay. I, I believe you are done with the question. Okay, is there a take home message for, from the listeners? Is there, is there, is there a learning point? Mm, not really, there isn't. Okay, there's this, what is the difference between BPE and BPH? BPE is clinical, okay? BPE is usually a clinical diagnosis. BPH is a histological diagnosis, okay? Initially, people used to use this word hyperplasia, but these days they use more of enlargement. It's more of clinical. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Who was the coordinator? We are having more of these sessions. Yes. I think we should be having more of these sessions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. I want to close it up, inshallah. Dr. really, we want to thank you so much for making uh, your good time to come and you know sp spend uh, and share this much knowledge with us, inshallah. As Dr. Yuniza said, you've really enjoyed this session and we should have uh, more of this. Next time, probably you can organize the how to uh, pick these things up, inshallah, on ultrasound and maybe the diagnostic and more cases. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Najma for making all the effort to go and clerk and present and prepare all the presentations. Thank you so much. I think it's been very worthy. We really thank you so much. Also to the participants, um, those who've asked questions and uh, everyone, inshallah, uh, Thank you so much also for participating and also attendance. Jazakallah, Dr. Thank you so much and good night.